Madame de poser, de, de pour me présenter ma réponse euh, au discours de trône 2019 comme chef du Parti vert et député pour la circonscription de Fredericton Sud. Three years ago, New Brunswickers were given. Sorry, Can we start that over. Yeah, it's recycling. Three days ago, New Brunswickers were given a throne speech. All the usual suspects were sought out for comment, and the speech itself was summarized by all of our major news outlets. It seems to have unfolded rather quietly, with the exception of some chickens in front of the legislature, calling attention to the very real plight of small farmers in New Brunswick. En fait, c'est possible qu'il y ait eu plus de reportages sur l'agriculture et leurs poules que sur le discours lui-même. Et maintenant, trois jours plus tard, Le discours disparaît du cycle des nouvelles et nous passons à la prochaine chose. No great discussions have been ignited, no real passion sparked, giving rise to public debate or engagement in any way. And that's a shame, Madam Speaker, because we have a lot to discuss. The throne speech, like many before it, lacked vision. And this painted a bleak picture of our province. We're very used to this bleak picture. It's been repeated ad nauseum for years. It's almost background noise at this point. This bleak picture paves the way for vague suggestions that tough and unpopular decisions are to come, Madam Speaker. On one hand, the government emphasizes that we are all in this together. And on the other, it says it will do as it sees fit, and so be it, if that means the government falls. When politicians mention tough decisions, it usually means cuts to programs that will leave vulnerable people with fewer resources. The Premier has stated that he isn't here to stay just to do a job. Is that really what we're at, where we're at? Where's the hope? Where's the vision and the deep care and concern for our citizens? Does the government really have no more to offer in terms of, guiding, of a guiding vision? J'ai écouté attentivement le discours de trône. Le discours contenait un certain nombre d'initiatives prometteuses. L'accent a été mis sur les soins de santé et sur les euh, gérances financières en période de difficultés économiques. Some hard facts were reiterated. The province is more indebted than our sister maritime provinces. We have 25% of children and more than 34% of New Brunswickers living in poverty. Or as the throne speech puts it, unable to pay their taxes. Make no mistake, phrasing it that way tells you a lot about the priorities of this government. Unable to pay taxes, but also unable to lead, a health, uh, lead full and healthy lives and facing continuous stress and hardship. Let's not forget that. I'd like to argue that now is not the time for tough decisions. Now is the time for innovative, creative, and inclusive decisions that seek to transform the way New Brunswick is governed in this province, Madam Speaker. Tough is one thing, not a bad thing, but when it isn't driven first and foremost by care for our citizens, including our most vulnerable, then it's empty. Who's tough, Madam Speaker? Our people are tough. Those who have been waiting months for a med medical procedure or to receive the public services they need. Those who have been working on small farms without adequate government support. Those who have been standing up, putting themselves out there and asking for change and climate action. The government is calling on all New Brunswickers to contribute now to a better tomorrow. And there's nothing wrong with that on the surface. Of course, we all have a role to play in shaping the future, Madam Speaker, every single one of us. We have seen the power one individual can have, have in affecting change, and we have also seen the power of what a collective, a group of people fueled by vision and determination, working together, can achieve. Vision is what I want to talk about, Madam Speaker. A better tomorrow. I think we can all agree that's what we want, but it's also an incredible cliché, and it means virtually nothing when a politician calls for a better tomorrow without backing it up with concrete actions founded on the principles of care, responsibility, and compassion, and a profound recognition of what forces and tough decisions got us into the mess we are today. En parcourant la province, je suis toujours frappé par la vitalité que je vois, l'engagement de nos gens envers leur communauté et les uns envers les autres. 
Cela transparaît dans l'important travail accompli chaque jour par de nombreux clubs philanthropiques, des groupes locaux, des organismes sans but lucratif et groupes de foi. Il y a tellement de Nébrunsequois et Nébrunsequoises qui font d'énormes efforts pour fournir des services essentiels à ceux et celles qui en ont besoin et qui sont forçant d'aider leur collectivité à prospérer. Je suis également impressionné par le dévouement des fonctionnaires à éduquer nos enfants, à soigner les, les aînés, à soigner les, mal, les, les malades et les blessés et à défendre la sécurité publique. We have so much heart here, Madam Speaker, and so much compassion. We care about each other in New Brunswick. The same degree of care and compassion should be reflected by our government, the systems it upholds, and the foundations it rests upon. It should also be reflected in the vision put forward by the government as leaders and stewards, vision that is rooted in the things that we as New Brunswickers value. The throne speech opened with a bold statement saying that the status quo is no longer an option. And Madam Speaker, I agree, it isn't. The boldness of that statement was not backed up by the rest of the speech. The vision, if it can be called that, put forward by this government sounded a lot like business as usual, with our economic debt given as the reason for adhering to the very status quo roadmap provided by the Higgs government. We do need a plan, and a good one, but we have come to a point in human history where we need to forge new paths collectively. We need to veer from the old roadmap, or old roadmaps we're used to. We need to dig deeper and reach higher. Our government should be leading the charge. I know that New Brunswickers are hungry for it and eager for opportunities to help make it happen. Ce qu'on nous, qu nous a offert, c'est un autre plan pour maintenir le status quo. Des mesures ont été proposées pour améliorer nos systèmes de soins de santé et d'éducation, mais peu a été dit sur ce que ces initiatives signifieraient. Il y a eu la reconnaissance du fait que le changement climatique est réel, mais il semble être presque une concession mentionnée seulement en passant, Madam Speaker. We live in a time of global climate crisis, the most pressing emergency we face as a species, and here is what our government, our leader, had to say. New Brunswick will do as much as it can to combat climate change. But what is as much as it can? It has never done as much as it can before. The throne speech outlined a number of initiatives to help communities confront the inevitable impacts of climate change. And I applaud this. But is examining how future risks can be mitigated really doing as much as we can? We must build a New Brunswick that is fueled and powered by renewable sources of energy, flowing water, changing tides, the sun, the wind, the biogas we can produce out of the waste streams from our industries processing food, fish, and wood, and from treating municipal waste. Je pense à Jacques et Roque Laforge, des producteurs de produits laitiers, laitiers et des entrepreneurs de Saint-André qui produisent du, du biogaz à l'échelle commerciale pour faire fonctionner leur propre centrale électrique. I think of Ray Robinson, the CEO of St. John Energy, who is establishing a green energy park to harvest the wind and sun along the Bay of Fundy coast, along with a utility-scale energy storage system that will supply thousands of homes with inexpensive electricity. I think of Jordan Kenny, Daniel Aaron, and Eric Hatfield from Stash Energy in Fredericton, who have designed an energy storage system for heat pumps. I think of Gunter Forrester from Bathurst, whose progeny Modern Homes has established a net zero energy subdivision in Riverview, where smart homes produce as much clean energy as they consume and require only 20% of the energy needed by typical homes. Madame uh, le Président, nous avons une province qui déborde d'entrepreneurs, d'artisans, d'artistes, de professionnels talentueux, de maîtres des métiers critiques, Nous avons tellement d'imagination, d'esprit novateur et de détermination à contribuer. C'est ça qu'il faut encourager et soutenir. La vision du gouvernement devrait au moins égaler celle de notre peuple. Oui, nous avons des décisions à prendre, des décisions sur le genre d'avenir dans lequel nous ne voulons investir et soutenir. Vision by its very nature emerges from the depths 
from our collective history and the best of what we can be imagined, that what we can imagine for the future. It is possible to imagine so much more for New Brunswick than what has been offered thus far. But we need to build our future together. We must not be divided by those who seek to divide us. Madam Speaker, we have a strong sense of place, and that is the envy of those living outside of Atlantic Canada. We are descendants of settlers, of refugees, of indentured servants and slaves who arrived in traditional, the traditional territories of the Lustakwi, Pesamakati, and Mi'kmaq, governed by peace and friendship treaties. Our past have been intimate, intimately intertwined for 400 years, and our future futures are intertwined as well. As a settler society, we have finally begun to acknowledge the dark truths of the historic relationship with First Nations, such as the residential school system's mandate to carry out cultural genocide. One of the reasons why there remain only 100 fluent speakers of the Wostokwe language today. We have a responsibility to help reverse this, Madam Speaker, just as we must address the issue of land, uh, of indigenous land tenure. I'm proud that I was able to gather the support of all members of this House to amend the Education Act to require the Minister to institute curriculum that implemented one of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action on educating our children about the relationship, past and present, between ourselves and Indigenous peoples. I was pleased to see the throne speech commit to establishing an all nations and parties working group on truth and reconciliation. This is an important next step, Madam Speaker, which I support and we look forward to participating in. Cependant, à bien des égards, nous demeurons trois solitudes, les communautés autochtones, francophones et anglophones. Le discours de trône n'a pas abordé les divisions qui semblent s'élargir parmi nous exacerbé par le populisme et la peur. Nous ne nous, euh, nous, ne nous connaissons pas bien, ce qui fait craindre à certains que les efforts vis, visant à préserver, préserver l'identité et les langues des francophones et des peuples autochtones va leur co euh, coûter quelque chose. What we need is an ongoing public conversation across our solitudes. This is why my colleague, the member for Kent North, has proposed the establishment of a standing committee on official languages, and why I support the creation of an official languages secretariat within government. We need to foster a better understanding of each other, Madam Speaker, and even more so with the rise of populism, populism which has become an alarming trend. Populists want us all to be the same. They seek a monoculture, and we know that monocultures are never healthy, Madam Speaker. Why are we seeing such a rise in populism, not just here, but globally? The reasons are complex and more than can be covered in this speech, but over time, many governing parties have lost sight of their responsibility to serve the public good, to safeguard and improve the well-being of people and their communities. Instead, traditional political parties have been captured by corporate agendas and have sought to run government, well, like a business. And when you run government like a business, Madam Speaker, inevitably people end up looking like liabilities. Costs in the budget, costs on the spreadsheet, not citizens. And we're to repeatedly told as a result that we are illiterate, unhealthy, overweight, disabled, unskilled, too poor, and just too old. But in all cases, we are a burden on the system, unaffordable, unable to pay taxes, just too expensive to care for or care about. It's why it is any wonder then, Madam Speaker, that people become alienated from government. En tant que parti vert, nous nous engageons à abandonner cette dangereuse approche budgétaire pour gouverner en faveur, en faveur d'une approche axée sur le citoyen, sur la compassion et sur la bienveillance. Nous nous connecterons, nous nous concentrons sur le bien-être des personnes, des communautés et de l'environnement naturel qui rend la vie possible pour nous et pour, et pour toutes les créatures. Of course, we must be cognizant of the performance of our finance, finances and our economy, but this has, this has been the singular obsession of successive governments, so that the welfare of our people, the strength of our communities, and the health of our environment have been seriously undermined.
Just look at the poor state of health care services, which are, we are reminded about <coughs> this week by a bed shortage at the Campbellton Hospital, which caused them to suspend vital services. More than 40 stretchers are being used as beds right now, and this is not an isolated incident. Our health care system has been unraveling for 20 years as governing parties transformed health care from a care-centered system to one that is budget-centered and heavily centralized. Success is not determined by patient care outcomes anymore or by the wellness of our population, no, but by dollars and cents. Take a moment to think about those patients ill and exhausted on those stretchers, Madam Speaker. When you're sick, already in a weakened state, to be left uncomfortable and exposed and often alone, listening to the loud bustle and clamor of a hospital while you wait for care. Think of the caregivers watching their family members suffer this way with no real spot to sit and visit and comfort them. In fact, Madam Speaker, just the other week, I met a family at a hospital whose aged mother had spent two days in the ER waiting to get into palliative care. Successive governments have allowed our system to reach this state. It's time we put the people first. The Parti Vert veut un système de santé axé sur les soins, axé sur les citoyens et intégré à la collectivité. Nous voulons un système qui prend des mesures significatives pour s'attaquer aux déterminants sociaux dans la santé, comme la pauvreté et l'isolation. Imagine if we were all patients of collaborative care teams working from clinics and community health centers that could provide chronic health care, acute health care, mental health care, and lifestyle support services, like the Fredericton downtown and the Elgin community health centers. We wouldn't be patients of a solitary doctor who would be the, our gatekeeper to the health care system, but patients of a care team that includes family doctors, nurse practitioners, registered nurses, midwives, dietitians, pharmacists, social workers, psychologists, health educators, and physiotherapists. And these exist, Madam Speaker, today in New Brunswick, but there are far too few of them. Imagine community clinics such as Clinic 554 that specializes that specialize in sexual, reproductive, and LGBTQ plus health care, funded by Medicare and accessible in every region of our province. Imagine si nous revenions à la gouvernance locale de nos hôpitaux, où les administrateurs auraient un véritable pouvoir décisionnel et où une planification à l'échelle de l'hôpital pourrait être instaurée afin que tout le personnel puisse développer un véritable sentiment de fierté et d'appartenance. More band-aids are not what is needed. That is why I proposed an all-party committee on health care reform that would hear from experts, <coughs> um, health professionals, and patients to develop recommendations for transforming the system to one that is care-based, citizen-centered, and embedded in our communities, a system that puts people first. The budget and spreadsheet-centered health care system that we have has not only led to hallway medicine and suspension of uh, health services due to overcapacity, but we have a mental health crisis to deal with as well. Mental illness is widespread in our province and poorly treated, and our suicide rates are among the highest in the country, with almost 14 deaths per 100,000 people every year, more than twice the rate of suicides in Prince Edward Island. Beaucoup trop de gens se sentent seuls dans cette province où les collectivités, où, où les collectivités sont très unies. Nous avons besoin de meilleures ressources et le gouvernement doit accorder la priorité à ce besoin. The speech from the throne made no mention of the health and welfare of our children, save for the issue of vaping in youth. Earlier this week, the Child and Youth Advocate released his annual State of the Child Report, which found that once again, the sexual violence perpetrated against children in New Brunswick is high, very high, in fact, 30% higher than in Canada as a whole. Madam Speaker, this is shocking, but does not appear to have made it to any government priority list. One third of New Brunswick youth experience symptoms of anxiety and depression. One Third, for poor youth and LG, LGBTQ plus youth, it is closer to 60%. And for indigenous youth, it is 45%. The average wait time for children and youth for mental health services now, from referral to assessment, is 44 days. 
the average time, wait time from, from assessment to actual treatment is 55 days. A total, Madam Speaker, uh, of 99 days before treatment. Imaginez si vous étiez le maire ou le, le père de ses fils et de ses filles du Nouveau-Brunswick qui vous regardent pendant qu'il est lout et attendant, attendant, attendant. Voilà le genre de résultat qui se produit lorsque le gouvernement ne met pas l'accent sur le bien-être de ses citoyens, mais qu'il est obsédé par les finances. To the parents listening, I understand the lengths you would go to care for your child if they were struggling, taking time off work, making sacrifices everywhere. Time and time again in New Brunswick, we see communities rally together to help families with, ch with children in need. Should our, not, should, our, should our government not be doing as much or more? These are our children. They should be at the heart of every decision we make, and we should be making decisions that serve their well-being. These should be tough decisions, Madam Speaker, not easy. They should be easy decisions, Madam Speaker, not tough. We need to put frameworks and systems in place that support those very decisions. Year after year, the Office of the Child and Youth Advocate provides essential information on the state of our children's welfare and makes improve, improve, important recommendations to improve the lives of our children and youth. Recommendations that are never discussed by this Legislative Assembly because there is no committee to receive their report. Imagine what the state of our children and youth would be if we put them first. It's no wonder that the Child and Youth Advocate reported this week that half of all youth say they have no one to look up to. We owe it to them. We owe it to them to demand a vision of New Brunswick that is care-based and focused on well-being, where no one has to live in isolation or fear that they are a burden or feel ashamed of who they are or what they're going through. The throne speech notes that 25% of children and 35% of adults in this province live in poverty but contains no initiatives to address this dreadful reality. We know that poverty is the key determinant of health and educational success. Only 28% of youth living in poverty say their family stands by them in difficult times. And 81% say they are not treated fairly by their communities. Half of racialized youth live in poverty. The throne speech spoke directly to New Brunswick's business community. Its vision was aimed at them, at business as usual. It did not seek to address those living in poverty, in isolation or in fear. Isn't it time for those bridges to be built? Isn't it time for the government to address the needs of all citizens, particularly those most in need of support? As Greens, we want to end abysmally low social assistance rates and the punitive social welfare rules which amount to government enforced poverty. People must be allowed to share accommodation without losing their social assistance and hold on to additional monies they may receive for child support or disability pensions. This is why I'll be tabling a bill to amend the Family Income Security Act, the Family Income Security Act, Madam Speaker, which ironically fails to provide in in income security to anyone. A long-term solution could be the establishment of a basic income guarantee. The federal government has been funding basic income guarantee pilot projects across this country. However, Premier Doug Ford has dropped out of the program in Ontario, which frees some of that some of those resources up, Madam Speaker. I believe New Brunswick should step up and insist that pilot projects are funded to be established here in New Brunswick. See whether basic income guarantees might make a significant dent in the poverty of this province. C'est la pauvreté et les maladies mentales qui font qu'il est difficile pour tant d'enfants de réussir à l'école. Ce ne sont pas nos enseignants ou le programme scolaire, si vous avez faim, si vous manquez de soutien à la maison, si vous vivez dans un environnement familial stressant, si vous avez vécu un traumatisme ou si vous souffrez d'une maladie mentale, cela se reflétera dans les résultats aux tests standardisés. Greens would put the well-being of current and future generations of New Brunswick at the heart of everything we do. Our goal must be that all New Brunswickers should do well, that everyone should be able to live 
an abundant life. I believe that with the right supports, everyone can thrive. That is the green vision for New Brunswick, and it comes from the heart. Please don't believe for one moment that this means that Greens do not want our businesses to do well, or that we don't believe in sound fiscal management. That could not be further from the truth. The idea that we have to choose between a care-centered system, a care-centered society, and, and prosperity is a false dichotomy and provides really no choice at all. By painting the bleak picture the throne speech does of New Brunswick, it's asking New Brunswickers to accept that our situation is so dire that only their business as usual approach can fix it. They're asking New Brunswickers not to dare for hope for more and better social services. They're warning us about the tough decisions to come. Once again, I call for innovative solutions, inclusive solutions. Let's make it really tough. Let's insist that our Premier rise above his current disheartening view of reality and find new ways of doing things with a renewed focus on every single citizen's well-being. Let's call for policies and programs that serve the most vulnerable among us as well as the comfortable and supported. The discord de Tron dit que le gouvernement veut dynamiser le secteur privé, mais c'est que ces décisions ne placent pas le bien-être des Néo-Brunswickois et de la résilience de nos collectivités comme leur objectif central. Les avantages, les avantages seront minimes. The nature of enterprises, Madam Speaker, matter. The kind of businesses we invest in matter. What we invest in will come to define us. Will the wealth generated by the businesses this government puts first flow out of the province, enriching shareholders elsewhere or into uh, offshore tax havens, or will they rest within our communities? Will the profits generated to be subject to, ta uh, be subject to taxation to support our public services, or will, or will they be shielded from taxation offshore? Are they looking to energize small businesses, cooperatives and social enterprises, or multinational corporations? Once again, in the speech, the singular obsession with exports is highlighted in the new mandate for opportunities, New Brunswick. Madam Speaker, we've been a trading province since before we were a province. But there are huge opportunities to expand local production to serve local markets for food, for renewable energy, for building products, and so much more. In New Brunswick, in fact, we produce less than 60% of the goods and services we need compared to 70% by, by Nova Scotia. Studies demonstrated that if we replace just 10% of imports using an import replacement strategy, by expanding local production instead, GDP would grow by $1.8 billion. Import replacement would strengthen our local communities and our local economies. We know that buying local is something New Brunswickers have a real appetite for, and measures and programs should be put in place to help encourage local entrepreneurs serving their own communities and regions. This is something that we really need to look at to end regional disparity in this province as well, Madam Speaker, and should be one of the elements that is brought to the table in addressing the disparity uh, in uh, the Chaleur region. Why are we not setting a goal to support the growth of small and medium-sized um, farms so we can feed ourselves in this province? Why are we not setting a goal to support the growth of local and diverse renewable energy suppliers for power, heat and fuel, and manufacturers of energy storage systems so we can be more self-sufficient in green energy? Certainly, there are entrepreneurs and co-ops across this province who are looking to do just that, but are running into barriers everywhere. Why aren't we ensuring that woodlot owners have fair access to the wood market and the ability to receive a fair price. Instead, the Minister of Natural Resources, for example, was quoted the other day as saying New Brunswick was open for business, not for renewable energy, but to experiment, to experiment with a small molten salt nuclear reactor. Such a thing has never even operated on a commercial scale anywhere in this world. Its costs are unknowable at this point and it carries with it the inherent safety, waste, and nuclear proliferation concerns of atomic energy dependent 
on plutonium containing fuel. Madam Speaker, technology to harvest the wind, the sun, flowing waters, and biogas from organic waste is proven. The costs are known and continue to fall and have none of the risks associated with atomic energy. Renewable energy, Madam Speaker, is our future, not plutonium. Let me ask you all, would you want a small molten sodium nuclear reactor operating in your community? Is this something your brothers and communities want? Or is this a high level business interest? This is about making tough decisions? Or once again, is it about money and stuffing the pockets of the elite few who would profit from such facilities? Sure, they'd create jobs, but so would facilities dedicated to working with renewable sources of energy with our own entrepreneurs and co-ops and local businesses. In 2009, the American poet Wendell Berry, also a farmer and an activist, wrote a stunning piece entitled Questionnaire. In this piece, he asked five very straightforward questions of modern citizens. One of these questions is, how much poison are you willing to eat for the success of the free market and global trade? Please name your preferred poisons. Well, Madam Speaker, I wonder how many New Brunswickers would list plutonium as one of theirs. The throne speech, makes, throne speech makes the commitment that it will do as much as it can to combat climate change, but it's silent on the economic transition required to achieve the necessary emission reductions, <coughs> or how to ensure that that transition is a just one. Nor does it set out any priorities for our building stock, transportation system, or energy supplies. The transition to a green economy provides plenty of opportunities for community economic development in every corner of the province, including the Schiller region. The future well-being of our children and grandchildren must be placed at the heart of a new vision for our province. The throne speech refers incorrectly that, uh, to the fact that New Brunswick is one of the most indebted provinces in Canada. Well, according to RBC, on a per capita basis, our debt is lower than that of Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and Newfoundland and Labrador, putting us in the middle of the pack. Now, I'm not... I'm not underplaying the fact that we have a significant debt and that we, need, we have to have a strategy to address that debt. Uh, but to continually use it as an excuse for uh, turning down innovative, inclusive, creative, uh, uh, and transformative changes to uh, our system, Madam Speaker, to restructuring it is unacceptable. Our debt to GDP ratio essentially stopped growing four years ago. And we have had a budget surplus since 2017, 2018. So those are the numbers. Those are, that's the reality. So I think we need to keep it in perspective. We're not at the mercy of our economy, nor, we must, nor we must, must we be beholden to cold, hard business decisions in the name of survival. In fact, if we want to survive and thrive, it's, for time, it's time for us to recognize that in fact business culture is evolving too, and businesses that aren't in lockstep with the increased demand for genuine social consciousness and climate action are going to become liabilities themselves. And increasingly, businesses in this province are recognizing that. The Nouveau Brunswick a une communauté d'affaires dynamique et un nombre croissant d'entrepreneurs, de rêveurs et d'agents d'action animés d'un esprit communautaire. Le gouvernement doit les servir comme il l'a fait depuis longtemps pour les grandes entreprises, parce que quelles sont la force motrice de notre économie future. Ils ont des réponses et des solutions que le gouvernement ne peut être pas, et nous devons discuter avec eux. We need more and diverse voices around the table. I am thrilled to see the progress we've made with immigration in this province, and the Green Party is committed to help create the types of communities that can attract and retain newcomers, places with the required infrastructure and services, places that are healthy and foster inclusivity, and that are a true pleasure in which to live. Fostering inclu inclusivity is key, Madam Speaker. One of the things I found most disappointing about the throne speech was its lack of inclusivity, its inability to balance its economic focus with addressing serious social issues and speak directly to all of our populations. Just as I was disappointed to hear no mention of the work being done by our child and youth advocate, I was also struck by the omission of any content in the speech about the issues facing women, seniors, and gender minorities in New Brunswick. Si nous voulons bâtir une économie plus forte, 
l'une des premières choses que nous devons faire est de créer un système qui encourage les femmes. Nous avons entendu dire à maintes reprises que lorsque plus de, plus de femmes sont à la table, des meilleures décisions sont prises et les entreprises en profitent davantage. Mais les femmes de Nouveau-Brunswick sont encore très mal servies par notre gouvernement. I applaud the work that a website called Amplify East is doing to bring the stories of successful women to light and that the rebuttal to that often heard argument that often heard argument about the reason there aren't more women in leadership positions because capable women just aren't out there, people say. It's not true. They are out there and they are here and we would be hearing from them a lot more if women in New Brunswick uh, didn't face the large number of unnecessary obstacles they do and if they were better served by government. According to Resonate New Brunswick, the top five challenges faced by women in New Brunswick are health, economic security and employment, accessing and providing care, safety and violence, and gender equality and discrimination. It's impossible to summarize the depths of each of these issues in this speech and the loss to our society, our culture, and our economy that we endure because women are not better served by government programs. The very structure of our society, in fact, presents them with needless obstacles that appropriate government supports could alleviate. And I believe that so much, Madam Speaker, because women end up doing much of the caregiving in our society, both for their own children and their aging parents. But with the lack of supports, that caregiving is never valued as it should be. Never. It's time we value caregiving because we all depend on it. The fabric of our communities depend on it. We have to demand that our government invest and support caregiving in the way that it should. It's time to put people first. Il est temps de mettre nos citoyens en première. It is my hope that some of what I have said today will inform the budget decisions this government will be making in the coming weeks and months. In the meantime, I encourage all of those who do not feel well served by the status quo reflected in the speech from the throne to make their voice heard in this democracy of ours. It's the way that change happens, Madam Speaker. It's always the way that change happens. Let's take our lead from the farmer who brought us flock of chickens to the lawn of the legislature this week. Be creative, be innovative, be active, be loud, stand up, and be counted. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Merci beaucoup.